Well, thank you everyone. My name is Jeff Kaufman. I'm an open source attorney for Red Hat. And we're going to talk this evening about Oracle v. Google and the fair use case, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. We're going to take a little bit deeper dive into that case and explain some of the more interesting aspects and the holdings of the case. Um, I want to first start out by talking a little bit about my background and you'll understand why. Back when I was 16 years old, I wanted to be a pilot. And one of the things you do when you're, when you're aspiring to be a commercial pilot is you take uh, instruction to be a flight instructor. So at 19 years old, I became a flight instructor. And one of the courses that the Federal Aviation Administration requires you to take, if you're not already a teacher like my wife, is to take something called Fundamentals of Instruction. They want to teach you how to be a teacher. And what I learned and remember from that course is concepts such as primacy and bias. And primacy, what you essentially learn first, sticks with you. And that can actually form biases in your thinking and behavior. So for example, when you're learning to fly an airplane, you want to learn how to avoid stalling the airplane. Stalling the airplane causes, in many cases, the nose to drop rather rapidly. You get some shaking, you get sirens or horns going off in the cockpit. Something you generally want to avoid. And the instinctive reaction that you're taught is when you get into that condition, is to immediately push down on the yoke to recover. Well, it turns out that many, many years later, the FAA had determined that certain types of stalls may require a different form of recovery. And there's been a number of accidents as a result of this. And it's very difficult for pilots like me who have been trained in the old way uh, to recognize and behave in that different way because of, of primacy and the bias that were uh, formed as a result of my early training. And the reason I bring this up is something similar happened to me in the legal profession. I went to Marquette Law School and became an attorney shortly after that. And one of the courses that I took was on copyright law. And in copyright law, we learned a concept called fair use. And I remember very clearly my professor telling us that you never want to try to argue fair use in a commercial context. You're generally going to lose. The deck is stacked against you significantly. And I don't remember a lot of my lectures from law school, but I, I do remember that lesson, and that stuck with me for a very, very long time, which is why when this case came up, where Google was arguing that their use was a fair use, which I will describe some of the elements of their argument, I was very biased. I said, there's, there's no way they're going to win this, because look at the commercial aspects and success of the Android platform. It would be difficult to argue, I would think, a fair use argument. And of course, I was wrong. And I really wanted to understand why I was wrong and why I formed that bias. And I spent a significant amount of time going through this case. And that's what I want to present you today as some of my findings and kind of walk you through uh, the journey that I took uh, with, this, with this case and, and, the, and the results. I do have to say just uh, for, uh, for completeness, I am an attorney, but I'm not your attorney. So if you have specific legal questions about unique issues to yourself or, or your organization, I do advise you to seek out counsel. What I'm providing here today is just some general perspective. And in terms of questions, uh, we can keep it somewhat interactive, but there's a limited amount of time. So we may have to uh, take some of those questions after the talk, and I'd be happy to stay here as late as anyone wants to answer those questions. So let's get started. And by the way, I appreciate everyone being here so late. So let's start out with the Java background. Uh, I've given this talk to lawyers and, and technologists, and I, I think some of the items here are, are uh, probably repetitive or well-known to the technology community, but let me just make sure we level set on this, because there's some terms that I use in subsequent slides that if I don't level set here, they may be confusing, at least the way I use them or the way the court used them. So you know, Java was created in uh, the mid-90s by Sun Microsystems which was eventually acquired by Oracle. And this enabled software developers to write programs to run on any Java virtual machine. Virtual machine being like a sandbox where you can run that program in, the virtual machine being a program that runs on a specific piece of hardware in an operating system. 
But so the idea here is that regardless of the underlying computer hardware, you can write your program once and deploy it anywhere. Great solution, right? So they came up with two different types. Actually, there's multiple versions of Java, as many of you probably know. But one of them is called Java Standard Edition Platform, Java SE. And that's a technology you know, targeted more towards computer systems, servers, desktop, laptops. And then there's the Java Micro Edition, which is a technology targeted towards embedded systems. At least it was back in the day. And it, it seems like they're targeting that more towards the Internet of Things uh, in, in that market. So Java SE, Java ME. Now, APIs are used in, in a wide variety of ways. Uh, I think it's a bit of an overloaded term, so to speak. Uh, I've had to be very careful in my practice when I'm speaking with clients about what they actually mean by an API. Means multiple things to multiple people. I think what we're going to have to do in this presentation is talk about it in the way that the court discussed it, because that led to the various holdings and and um, communications that they had in their documents. So API here stands for Application Programming Interface, and the way the court describes this, it's a job that allows Java programs to use pre-written programs to build certain functions in their own Java apps rather than having to write them themselves. So the example I often used, at least with non-technological technological audiences, is you know, if you wanted to compute the square root, right, you're not going to go to your old math book and figure out how to do that uh, and the algorithm for that. You're going to just call the math.sqrt or whatever the equivalent is in Java uh, to do that, right? So, but as defined in this case, right, the copyright dispute in this case involved 37 packages of computer source code and they refer to these groups of computer programs individually and collectively as the API. So whatever your idea of what an API is, this is how the court defined it in this case. So I like graphics, I'm kind of a visual person, so I, I drew this up. And this describes what we call the structure, the sequence, and the organization, or under US law, what we call SSO, is, is how we abbreviate that. Uh, for the organization of this API that it was of interest in this case. And it starts out on the left side, uh, as in the blue column, as packages. So you have Java AWT, Java.lang, Java.io. And if you look inside those packages, like Java.lang, you'll see a number of classes, like class byte, class long, class math, class number, so on and so forth. If you look inside one of those classes, like class math, you'll see ABS, max, min, ULP, Every time I give this presentation, I cannot remember what ULP stands for. Maybe someone in the audience does know. Units in the last place. Thank you. Yes, I've given this presentation like 10 times and I didn't know what it was. It tells you what the precision of a floating point value is. Awesome. Thank you. So we're, I did not use that one as an example, but we're going to look at the method, dot, the method, the max method as an example here. But you can see as, you know, ABS would be absolute value, max is to compute the max of two values, and so on and so forth. So what's interesting here is each of these packages is a class, and then these classes divided up into methods. And what is critically important in this case is the way that this is structured and organized. This organization of packages, methods, class, classes, and methods is actually copyrightable expression, or can be copyrightable expression. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. And that was really the essence of this case. So each Java method is broken into two components. Right? We have declaring code, the method declarations, and we have the implementing code. So the method declaration identifies the pre-written function, it identifies the method body, the input names, and other functionality. Um, and then we have the way that you implement that function. So this is an example of what I pulled from OpenJDK and what I also pulled from Android. So we have a, a method you know, declaration of a sort. We have public static long max, long A, long B. And uh, being a technical audience, I'm not going to explain 
all those elements. Does anyone want me to take a deeper dive into that? Long A, okay. And it returns a value, right? It says if A is greater than or equal to B, then uh, return A, otherwise you return B. And then Android, uh, we have a very similar uh, declaration at the top, static long max, long A, long B. Uh, you'll notice the implementation is slightly different, right? There's just greater than, not greater than or equal. So the, the top non-bolded line is, is more of a method declaration that defines the name, the inputs, and the outputs. The bolded section is the implementing code, as we all know. Now, these are slightly different. The implementing code is slightly different, but they do have the same result, correct? No. Thank you. They do have the same result, correct? No. No? no? For long, yes. I'm asking the wrong audience for this, but, but if, if, I think the, the issue is if A and B are equal for longs, uh, the first one's going to return A, the second one's going to return B, right? But A and B are equal, so it really wouldn't matter? Yeah. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make is someone in the Android team created a version of this method, the implementing code, but they did it in a slightly different way. And I don't know, perhaps if you did it the second way for Android, it runs more efficient on a mobile device. Maybe it uses less battery power. Maybe it runs it unclear. But the point is, you can have different pieces of implementing code, and they can be written separately while having the same method declarations. And why am I elaborating on this point? Because um, the copyright infringement case here was not, save for one item, was not about the implementing code. It was about the method declarations, okay? So here was Oracle's complaint. They had some patent uh, complaints and they also had copyright infringement complaints. I'm not gonna talk about the patent side of this except for the reason about why it went to a certain court, okay? The key of this case, at least the, I think the most interesting part to all of us is the copyright side of this. So the copyright claim consisted of an infringement of 6,000 method declarations, 6,000 of those declarations we talked about, of, of the example I show here. And the structure, the sequence, and the organization of all of those declarations. The fact that they copied those method declarations, all 6,000 of them, they in essence copied the structure, the sequence, and the organization. And as I talked about before, both the, the method declarations themselves as literal elements may be copyrightable, protectable expression. The structure and the sequence in the organization, what we call, lawyers call non-literal elements, are also protectable under copyright law. So, a couple things in this case that were not in dispute. The Java language is not copyrightable itself. Google admitted copying almost 12,000 lines of declaring code from those API packages from Java SE. They admitted copying all those method declarations in essence. And that the declaring code reflected that structure of the sequence in the organization. That is not in dispute. And key, Google wrote all of their implementing code, except for one function, which I'm not going to talk about. It was just a small part of the case. So all that implementing code, when they wrote it for Android, not copied from, from Java, from uh, Oracle's Java. Okay, so here's what happened in terms of key events. 2007, Google announces Android. 2010, Oracle acquires Sun. 2012, we have the first jury trial. The jury found that there was copyright infringement of the 37 API packages. So the jury said, yeah, they copied it. And the trial court subsequently decided, though, that what they copied was not copyrightable expression. So I just said all those method declarations and the structure, the sequence of the organization could be copyrightable expression. But the judge, the, the court said, in this case, they're not copyrightable expression. So I don't care what the jury says, even though you infringed it. It's not copyrightable to begin with, so there could be no copyright infringement. Make sense? And the jury was also asked to look at just in case this thing went on appeal, because they knew it would, whether if they did copy it and it was copyrightable expression, would Google's use be a fair use? And they didn't decide that at the lower court. 
So at the end of 2012, we're in a situation where, um, you know, Google was found to infringe, but they infringed something that wasn't copyrightable, so they're off the hook, right? So then, um, there is the, uh, an, an appeal. This goes to the Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit. This is a really strange court in that they normally only hear patent cases. They don't normally hear copyright cases. The reason they heard this case is because there was an element of patent infringement here. So it went to this case that normally doesn't hear this type of thing. They reversed the decision of the first trial and they found that the API code was copyrightable. Uh-oh. So now Google was already found to infringe, and now they infringe something that was, right, they can infringe because it was copyrightable. Okay, so now what does Google have to argue? They have to argue now that their use was a fair use under the law. We're going to talk about what fair use is in a minute. Is everyone with me so far? Very confusing court history here about what happened and a lot of nuanced issues, but this is, this is a, I think, a good summary of that to where we're at. And there's a question in the back, yes? Please use mics. I'm sorry? Please use microphones. There's a microphone right here. Somewhere. If you could briefly describe the jury in, in, these, in these courts. The juries? Yeah. Are they just lay people? They were lay people, and in fact, both juries were different. Uh, when we go to the jury trial on fair use, it was a different jury than the first, uh, the first case. Yes, these were your neighbors. Yeah, not, generally probably non-technical people, which when I read the jury instructions, I, 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 I try to synthesize a lot of the court documents and the jury instructions, and uh, you know, it was a very involved set of instructions that was presented to the jury, and uh, I actually felt for them that this would be a very, very difficult uh, thing to process, right? I think it would be increasingly difficult if you didn't have a technical background. Uh, but, and they did a very, very difficult job uh, uh, to do. Good. Uh, I'm confused. You said the second trial uh, found a patent case, but then they were arguing about fair use. Aren't those separate laws? Yeah, completely separate thing. What I was trying to say, and I'm sorry I didn't make that clear, is because there was a patent element as part of the initial complaint that when, it, when this case was appealed, it went to the special court. If there was no patent element, it would have went to a different court in the Ninth Circuit. But it, because there was patent aspects in the original complaint from Oracle, it ended up being appealed to the special court that normally hears patent cases and other interesting cases in the United States, but normally not by itself copyright issues. So the, sec the second court wasn't considering the patentability of it at all? Well, there, there, was, it, uh, there was some patent issues in the case, but that's just kind of beyond the scope of what I wanted to, to discuss. But it's because of the patent issue that it went to that court, uh, which it normally, a copyright case in itself would not normally go to the CAOC. So, in 2016, the second jury trial was remanded back down. There was a, the jury, which was a different jury, found that Google's use of the copyrighted API code was a fair use. Okay? Now, Oracle has appealed again, so the story is not over. Let's talk about where we're at. I think there's a common misconception about this case. When the community heard that Google was successful on a fair use argument, I think there was an idea that APIs are not copyrightable, okay? What, what happened here is Google's successful argument in that 2016 second jury trial that Google's use of the API was a fair use doesn't change the earlier appellate CAFC decision, okay? That decision still stands and that Oracle's API code is copyrightable expression. Oracle's API code, right? In this specific case, their code was copyright, is copyrightable expression. It's just that Google was successful to argue that their use of that copyrightable expression was a fair use under the law. 
Um, and the reason I talked before about the CAFC to kind of address this other question is that they normally don't hear copyright cases. And I think because of this decision at the CAFC level about whether this code is copyrightable or not, they're finding that it was, I think it has limited precedential value in the court systems. Um, it would be influential or persuasive in certain cases, um, but it may not be all that significant uh, just due to the nature of the way appeals are handled in the United States, that this court's opinion just it may not be all that significant, but it certainly will be persuasive. And it depends on what circuit uh, that a case similar to this may arise and how it will be appealed. So, <laughs> what I'd like to do now is put all of you in the jury box, okay? And I'm gonna present to you, in part, what the jury heard in this case about fair use. So you're in 2016, you're in the fair use jury trial, the second trial, or I should say the third trial, right after the appeal. And again, what I had done before is I tried to synthesize a number of court documents to try to come up with what may have been argued at this case. I, at this trial, I was not at the trial. I do know some people that were there. Uh, it, um, you know, what I could try to do the best I could is try to glean and understand a little bit from those, all those documents, really what was presented uh, and kind of focus on the key arguments because we only have 20 more minutes, so. But fair use, how do you argue fair use if you're Google, okay? Fair use, there are four statutory factors for fair use and there's one non-statutory factor. We're gonna talk about all of these. The first one is purpose and character of use. Actually, before I go there, I do have to say, in the jury instructions, they were presented all of the law around fair use and what all of these elements, statutory and non-statutory elements mean, how you should interpret them, uh, and in the context of this case, how they should be interpreted. But it's complicated, and you're gonna find out as we discuss this that some factors influence other factors, and there's kind of this pull and push and urging different directions depending on what one factor finds. It may put more weight on another factor, and it, it's, uh, it's a, um, a holistic experience, I guess. You just have to look at the whole thing and come up with an idea at the end. Is, does this fair, sound like fair use or not after you evaluate all of these factors? All right, so the first one is, uh, under purpose and character of use is the fact that bad faith, okay, doesn't support fair use. So, you know, there are many people at uh, Google that understood at least that the declaring code and their structure, their organization of those APIs was free to use and re-implement. Both, you know, as a, basically as a matter of developer practice and the availability of independent implementations of the API enhanced the popularity of the Java language, which Sun was promoting as free for all to use. Um, and there were people at Google that testified that in Google's view, the practice of duplicating declarations existed and that the real competition was on implementations, right? And I talked about before, maybe that way they implemented that max function was more efficient in a mobile device. Now, Sun was arguing that, in Oracle now, that Google needed to get to market very quickly. And early on in this case, right, there was discussions between Google and Sun about licensing Java, and frankly, those negotiations broke down. So there was these arguments that, well, you know, maybe Google worked in bad faith. Okay, so that's the arguments that went on bad faith. The second point about character purpose and character of use is around commercial purpose. So this is what I talked about earlier with my earlier bias. Commercial purpose weighs against fair use, that is clear. But even a wholly commercial use, okay, may still constitute a fair use. Contrary to maybe what I thought out of law school. So, I don't think there was much of an argument in this case that the use was commercial, although there may be some disagreement about the extent. But Google's use 
Google was arguing that their use was not entirely commercial. Google's decision to make Android available open source and free for all had non-commercial purposes. You know, general interest in sharing software and promoting innovation. This, the last aspect of purpose and character of use is transformation. And transformation supports fair use. I'm going to talk about that in the, the next slide. But the more transformative a work is, other factors such as commercialization recede in importance. Okay, so if you're more transformative, you have a better argument for a fair use argument, being successful on a fair use argument. So Google argued that its work was part of a new mobile platform versus desktops and laptops. And Google combined it with brand new methods, classes, packages written by Google for the mobile space. And they argued that this constituted a fresh context, giving new expression and meaning to the duplicated code. I.e., it was transformative. And Google, or Oracle argued that Google used the exact lines of declaring code, at least those portions, and their structure and sequence and organization with no new meaning, meaning or expression. So that's the way the two arguments went. So the key here is that the more transformative something is, other factors such as commercialization will receive in, in importance. And really, what is transformative, right? It works transformative if it adds something new with further purpose or different character. Uh, altering the first with new expression, meaning, or message. You can get transformation when you change a work or you even use the work in a different context. So here, taking Java SE and now moving that to the mobile space could be an example of transformation. Okay, so let's go on to the second um, factor for fair use. Fair use favors functional works versus creative works. Okay, this is the nature of the copyrighted work. Um, sorry, I lost my, uh, my notes here. So what Oracle argued here is that the process of designing APIs are highly creative and thus at the core of copyright protection, which doesn't favor fair use. And there was some testimony from various designers of many of the Java APIs saying that API design is an art, it's not a science. And then Google's experts were emphasizing the functional role of these declaring lines of code they were trying to minimize the creative aspect, okay? The next factor is the amount copied. Now it turns out, does anyone know what percentage of lines of code, for example, that was copied from Java SE that was put into Android? Anyone have a guess in terms of percentage? Zero. What was that? One, yeah. Less than one. It was about one. Copy one percent. It's important when you look at this about what you copied from, not what you copied to. Um, so you're not looking at the percentage of what went in, of, of Android, of what was copied. It's what you copied from. Um, so the amount copied, you have to evaluate the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relationship to the copyrighted work as a whole, relation to Java SE. And wholesale copying doesn't preclude fair use, per se, but certainly goes against it. So you see all these factors kind of weigh against each other. And the extent of permissible copying varies with the purpose and the character of use. If you only copied enough to be transformative, then this factor doesn't weigh against the accused. Okay, so if they only copied enough to make it usable for mobile, then this factor doesn't have a lot of weight. And then the last factor was the effect on the market. So Google argued, and, and this is probably obvious, but if, if you materially impact the marketability or the value of the copyrighted work, that cuts against an argument for fair use. So what Google was arguing is that Android didn't cause any harm to the market for Java SE, which was targeted for desktops and laptops, not mobile. And Java ME, right, the micro edition, 
to the extent that targeted mobile device was declining in revenue as predicted by Sun before Android was even released. So they were arguing that Android had no further negative impact on Java ME. And that APIs are open source under OpenJDK, which is one of the code snippets I showed previously, under the GPLv2 and ClassPath exception. Anyone could have copied those APIs without any fee, of course subject to the GPL copyleft terms. So how could Google's activity really harm Oracle's market in light of all three of those arguments? And then there's other factors, and this is non-statutory, so it's not written into the, into the code, um, you know, our, our legal code. But the jury was instructed to consider any additional circumstances, pro, con, that in their judgment bear on the ultimate purpose of the Copyright Act, including protection of authors and the right of fair use, namely to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. And this is why we have patent law and copyright law is to promote the progress in science and the useful arts. So the question is, did Android do that? Did it promote the progress of science and the useful art? I mean, this is kind of a squishy little, you know, non-statutory factor, but it is part of the, the law in the United States, and it was one of the factors that the jury was asked to, to use and synthesize with all the other factors to come up with uh, a decision on whether Google's use was a fair use. So this is, after all of that, this was the single piece of paper that was presented in front of the jury after the jury instructions. And it said, has Google shown by a preponderance of the evidence that its use of Android in the declaring lines of, of the declaring lines of code and their structure, their sequence, their organization from Java to SE constitute a fair use under the Copyright Act? That's what they were asked to analyze, and they either had to check yes, or they had to check no. That was the only question after all of this, right? So, what, what would you decide? Who would, would have found in favor of, of Google? And by the way, there's no right or wrong answer. You, you could have been in the jury and had a different conclusion, right? So, this is for Google. Okay. Seems more than half. I should ask the other way. How about Oracle? This is a biased audience. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. I figured that. How so about I'll Oracle? Say them both. <laughs> so we know how this ended up, right? It was in favor of Google. So the current disposition here is that the Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit still that decision still stands that API method declarations and their organization, their structure, their organization, of the type in this case, right, are copyrightable expression. The lower court decision on fair use, right, does not reverse that higher court decision, right, holding that this API could be copy, is copyrightable. But I think the impact of that ruling is still questionable for the reasons I talked about. And then Oracle has, has filed an appeal. So that is, the case in a nutshell. And I, I hope my, my goal here was to e explain the technical side and the legal side and, and maybe get rid of some misconceptions that were in this case. And, uh, and I hope all of you found, found this useful. I'm, I'm happy to take some questions here on the stage or we can do this after the event. I really want to thank you for your time and uh, for coming out this evening. Thank you. So you mentioned that uh, you thought the Federal Circuit decision would not be significant. You didn't explain why, but you did say it was sort of persuasive. So to the degree it is persuasive, what would be the avenue to undo the persuasiveness? Or in other words, how could the Federal Circuit decision be overturned? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great, great question. So this case, if it was normally if it didn't involve patents, it would have gone to the, uh, one of the appellate courts in the Ninth Circuit. And then to the extent there were other decisions in other circuits, uh, there, there could be a split in those decisions and that gets resolved ultimately at the Supreme Court. 
So I, I think, uh, you know, to the extent there's other decisions in, in other courts outside the CAFC and, and we start to get a split, I imagine that could ultimately get resolved in the Supreme Court. Um, in terms of being persuasive, right, so this goes to what court would actually be bound by this decision. So the CAFC was bound, was required, even though they're not in the Ninth Circuit, they were required to use Ninth Circuit law. And it, it actually is a bit unclear to me if, if this went to the Ninth Circuit again, a similar case to the Ninth Circuit, whether they would be bound by that decision. I don't think so, but I think it would be highly persuasive because that court was supposed to be applying Ninth Circuit law. Now, if it went to another circuit, it would be less persuasive because right? it was Ninth Circuit law, not this other circuit's law. Um, so it's kind of an interesting uh, issue, but that's why I think it, it may just have some limited impact because I think it, at best it's only highly persuasive in the Ninth Circuit and less persuasive in other circuits. I suppose if a similar case went in front of the CAFC again, uh, they may be bound to that decision, that court only. So from a, a layperson's perspective, one of the reasons why this particular uh, uh, court decision has been interesting is that it seems to weigh in on directly on the uh, copyrightability and fair use of interfaces as opposed to code. And one of the things that, that at least that appears to be related, and I'm curious if it actually is related, is it seems to be related to one of the probably the most famous open question in free software licensing which is that if you write a program that links with the GPL library, is the program required to be covered by the GPL, which seems related to this question of, is the interface part of the copyright? Is this at all related? And I, I'm curious to clear that up, because I know that people, some people think it is, some people think it isn't. It's a great question. Uh, frankly, I, I think that discussion, you know, has been going on for well before I got into open source. I don't think I could clear it up right here on the stage as a result of this case. Uh, I think the, the issue about what the GPL actually covers, you know, relates to you know, some of the text in the GPL about what is a program, if you look at that. Uh, you could certainly do some derivative works analysis and some of those, use some of those legal tools, but if you look at the spirit of the GPL, you know, what is, a, what is an entire program and what do they mean uh, for that entire program to be subject to GPL terms? So, you know, we could have a discussion after, after this. I, I, I'm not going to be able to clear up that. And certainly today, I'm, I'm sure uh, the world would love perhaps more clarity on that. But uh, that, that's uh, beyond, I think, our, our talk for today. So, but happy to talk to you after the, the talk. So right at the start, you defined that a language could not be copyrighted. The API, is that not the definition of what the language is? I think when they're, it's a good question. When, when they're talking about the language is not copyrightable, it's, you know, some of the syntax that's used, how you maybe multiply numbers together, just overall how Java is constructed, not the, the, of the language elements itself, but not, not necessarily the API. But it, it is a little bit squishy, right? Um, about what that means, but I, I think when the court was talking about that, they were talking about just the, the low-level syntax of the language itself, but not not the API, right? Because that clearly was carved out as something that could be copyrightable expression in terms of the method declarations themselves and the way all those method declarations were organized in that taxonomy that I showed on that picture. We can talk after the. So, uh, so the, there were a number of frustrating things about for all of us for this case. The most frustrating for me was to hear a project I named and an exception I helped write be talked about by a federal court. That was very odd. Uh, Namely, a class path exception. Uh, but the thing that bothered me most was this problem with what an API is. Um, I think most developers have it to quote another U.S. Uh, court thing. They know an API when they see it. 
Uh, but when you start to analyze what's copyrightable, what, what copyrightable components end up in an API, I can only find three things that could be copyrightable. There's the implementation, which I think it was shown pretty clearly in the case was not infringed. I actually don't even think the max function was infringed. I think it was an accident that he happened to write it exactly the same way. Um, that's a question of fact, obviously. Um, but the documentation for the API, which clearly wasn't infringed. And then all that's left is the function signatures. And I don't think the appeals court, when I read the decision, really explained what copyrighted material they felt composed the API. So do you have any opinions about what, what is the copyrightable material that is the API, in your view? And how does that relate to the decision? Yeah, great, great question. I think there were a lot of unfortunate issues in this case. Uh, so really, I'll talk about what the court discussed, um, and then maybe we can take a little deeper dive into that, either now or, or afterward. So the, the piece that was a little more clear and crisp to me in that decision, the appellate decision anyway, was the fact that you had non-literal elements, structure, sequence, organization, uh, of that API that was viewed as copyrightable expression, and they viewed it as copyrightable in this case. And, and that, I think, is something that may have been unexpected for people that don't study copyright law uh, by trade. Um, so again, could you, you know, could you pop back to your slide with the definition of non-literal in this context? I'm having trouble remembering it. Um, so I think this is probably the, okay, so that's the non-literal side of it. Okay. So the, the fact that they copied like 6,000 of these function prototypes, method declarations, right? The, the fact that they copied all of those naturally led to them copying the organization. Because, you know, it's like java.lang.math.max, right? And you start laying all these out, you start getting this taxonomy. And it was the way that organization occurred that caused us to have non-literal copyright um, protection, right, attached to this, this taxonomy. But then there's also the, the method declarations themselves. So that would be the public static long max, long a, long b, okay. They sadly, I think, you know, this is my own opinion, that they did attach copyright protection, perhaps, to these method declarations themselves. These really short phrases, right? And as a copyright attorney for many, many years, frankly, I've never given a lot of weight that there's, you know, if there's copyright protection on, on just those names, those function names, I mean, it's gotta be really, it's paper thin, right? But yet the appellate court here seem to discuss the possibility that these things could be copyrightable themselves. And, and I th they had some logic behind it. I, I think it was, it was a little bit confusing and I don't think it had a lot of, um, I think it just added a lot of confusion to the case. I think the second part, the SSO, was a little bit more, at least clear in my mind, about what the colorful arguments were there about copyright protection. So that's kind of the two areas where copyright protection attached in the case. So, good. We have time for maybe one more question. Maybe somebody can get that um, Okay, I've got more of a piece of advocacy than a question. I'm sorry. It just makes, it, makes me so mad. Because from, from my perspective, the CAFC is used to seeing patent cases. So they looked at a mixed copyright patent case and saw just patents. Because think about it. APIs are an interface to something. It's like a gizmo, the, like a replacement fuel pump for your car. So the interface is the part that fits to the other components in your car. I mean, everybody loves these car analogies. Actually, everybody hates them, but I'm going to use one anyway. Um, but, you know, how are you supposed to, I mean, the whole point of a patent is to say, okay, I've got the machine of this design that does this thing and nobody else can do it. In exchange, you know, I'm publishing my design and in 17 years, um, give or take, more if I'm a pharmaceutical, um, uh, then everybody will be free to use this. 
But with copyright, the argument is, okay, well, if you can some, come up with something that is just as good as Mickey Mouse, just as entertaining, say, calling Bugs Bunny, then, uh, you know, that's your independent thing, and there's no relationship between the two. Uh, you know, in, in software, let me, let me point out, if nobody's ever noticed this, probably many of you have, uh, the BSDs didn't like the fact that Reblind was under full GPL, and they went and on at least two, possibly three occasions, uh, people uh, have re-implemented the Reline API. So, uh, you know, our, the question we should ask ourselves was this a legitimate thing to do or not? Um, because according to the CASC, uh, that was not legit. Because Reline's API, which has a lot more claim to creativity, I would submit, than um, you know, math.sqrt. How many ways are you going to write that for integers? It might have been fair use for the BSDs to do it, though. Okay, fair point, but I mean, I, I don't think it should, the case shouldn't have had to reach that. But like I said, that's more of an obvious thing. But what, what I'd invite you to say is, like, what's the weakness in what I'm saying? How would you argue against me? It just, a, just a couple brief points about that. Uh, you know, although the, the CAFC is, does primarily hear more patent cases instead of copyright cases, I'm not sure if I read the opinion that they really conflated those two to any great extent. I think they, they did try to apply, at least from my understanding, of copyright law principles uh, in there. I didn't see them conflating those two to any, I, I don't remember seeing that. Uh, the, um, the other thing that I would just caution everyone on is that this case was very fact specific with what Google did with Java. And other examples uh, that you may have, like the one you brought up, I'm not directly familiar with that. You know, just be cautious about applying those, uh, the facts in that case to the facts in this case. There, there, there may be remarkable differences that you have to uh, take into account. So. so let's thank Jeff again for his very interesting talk, and he will be glad to take your questions. <laughs>